Now it's time for the famous DuPont disaggregation of return on equity. As I was just saying before, return on equity looks at the returns of the company from the stockholder's perspective. And this is really a product of two different things. It's a product of return on assets and what we call leverage, how much money the debt have. So what we want to do is we want to not only calculate return on equity, but we want to understand why it is what it is. And what is driving return on equity? Is return on equity being driven by profitability? Or is it being driven by leverage? And this is important because we need to know how levered the company is. And there's two approaches to doing this. One is the traditional DuPont analysis breaks return on equity down into profitability, productivity, and leverage. But the second method, which is what we're going to focus on more in this course, focuses takes an operating approach and focuses on operating activities versus non-operating activities. Operating activities is what the company does to make money. Non-operating activities are other things the company may do on the side. And so we're going to talk about DuPont disaggregation right now. But the real focus of the course is going to be on using the operating non-operating approach which research has shown is a more reliable measure of performance and is more closely related to stock value. Let's go into the traditional DuPont analysis though. What we can do is we could take return on equity and we could break it into two components. Return on assets, and that's net income divided by average total assets. We saw that in a previous chapter. Multiplied by average total assets divided by average stockholders equity. And that's a measure of leverage. It's called financial leverage. So this first measure here, return on assets, is all about company performance. Whereas financial leverage is all about how extremely levered the company is, how much debt the company has outstanding. And we know that debt is a two-edged sword. We're going to deal with this over and over again. If a company is profitable, then a good amount of debt is going to make the company more profitable. On the other hand, if the profit company is not profitable, then debt is going to push it in the other direction and make it even less profitable or increase the losses. So return on equity is higher where there's more debt and less equity. But if you're losing money, then you're going to lose even more money if you have debt. And therefore, debt increases risk. So we want to know, is the return on equity coming from company performance? And how much of it is coming from risk? Because risk might be good or in many cases, it might be quite dangerous. Let's talk a little more about return on assets. And return on assets measures the return from the perspective of management or the entire company. And it would be net income divided by average total assets, as we saw before. And to increase it, you need to do one of two things. You either need to increase your net income or decrease your average assets. Because either you know, you're going to increase the numerator or you're going to decrease the denominator. And so what managers can do is they can focus on one of two things if they want to maximize return on assets. They can focus on increasing the net income or they can focus on decreasing the total average assets that they use. And either one of those numbers will may help maximize return on assets. Financial leverage is something managers may not have any control over. And it is basically in the amount, it it's, depends on the amount of debt that you have. So the more the company finances its assets with debt rather than equity, then the greater the financial leverage. And so l financial leverage itself creates risk. So if a company is profitable and it's risky, it's going to become more profitable. But if a company is unprofitable, as I said before, then it's going to be even less profitable and that would be bad. So you may have problems. What makes this complicated is you may have preferred stock or a non-controlling interest. A lot of companies have non-controlling interests. If you took advanced accounting, you've seen this before. Preferred stock would be stock that has a fixed dividend and would have preference in payment of the dividend over the common stockholders. So in other words, 
the company, if it chooses to pay dividends, has to pay a certain dividend to the preferred stockholders before it can pay that dividend to the common stockholders. And so if you were to calculate return on equity in the presence of preferred stock, and very few companies nowadays have preferred stock, we always teach it, but um, I found maybe two percent of companies actually have preferred stock. So you're unlikely to see this unless you go into it professionally. So what you would do is in your return on equity, you'd go net income minus preferred dividends. And in the denominator, you would subtract average preferred equity from average stockholders equity. So this way you only focus on common equity and then preferred equity becomes a separate category really that's how it happens non-controlling interest is a little trickier non-controlling interest would be a situation where a parent owns a subsidiary but they don't own 100 percent of the subsidiary let's say the parent owns 90 percent of the subsidiary so 10 percent of the subsidiary belongs to somebody else that somebody else is what's called the non-controlling interest so this is a group of investors who own a small amount of stock in a company that the parent controls. And what you would always do is you would always focus on the controlling interest and you would not include the non-controlling interest. So that would mean that when you're calculating return on equity, you would include all net income attributable to the parent or to the parent shareholders. And in the denominator, you would exclude any non-controlling interest from the denominator.